It's an environment that young Fijian people are brought up in and a pressure they have to put up with that others perhaps don't have to, which could explain a lot of the differences, not only on educational achievements, but uh, personal aspirations, value systems, uh, the difference in prison numbers. I think they all go back to that kind of thing. Among the Fijian, the Vakaturang uh, principles, or what do we say, the Vakaturang uh, ethos, is uh, an ethos of what I might say, uh, character, relating to character and the quality of the person. A person who is said to be Vakaturang must be very, very helpful. He must not talk unnecessarily to anyone that he doesn't know. He is uh, very capable of looking after others, and he's always willing to help others. Uh, sometimes today, when people talk about uh, that they want the Vakaturang away, it does not necessarily mean that they have to have a leader as such. But what it really means, the deepest meaning of the whole thing, is that the person has the quality to live with the other members of the group. And to live with the other members of the group, the Vakaturang uh, values are imposed right from the beginning when the child is small. So, we planted potatoes about uh, seven months. Yes, we did. And harvest. Ah! Yeah, I take the potatoes to the market. About six potatoes are $10. They're in Fiji, they sold this one. This uh, is this uh, our money. So, everybody staying home, plant. If you no plant, you got no money. You got, you got some dollar, you got a money. <laughs> Yeah. And some boys, uh, they, they got a uh, garden too. This one, they got a garden too, my grandson here. Garden down here. And uh, we teach them to plant some taros in each, very each, each in every garden. The group or the family, the family group is a very important means of uh, security for the family. You know, when I talk about security, food and defense and uh, life and all sorts of kind of security that you can think of. The family provides everything. Yeah. So by the time this child is interact within the same uh, wider group, he already acquires the the Vaturang behavior and the other value system, very important for the survival of the whole group. We the Fijians, very big problem. Problems in the church, problems in the in the garden, problems in the in our village to do some work from there. And very few hours to work in our garden. The people still live a communal kind of life. And uh, I mean, in a Western capitalistic society, you, every individual comes first. Eh? But for Fijian, traditional Fijian society is a communal society. You achieve your objective in a Fijian communal society through, through the, the efforts of the whole community, not your individual effort. But uh, for capitalist uh, Western society, you, 
you achieve your things through your own individual hard work. So this, I mean, this, these are two totally opposite, uh, uh, shall we say, way of life. And uh, one, one problem facing the youth of today is, uh, is trying to balance these two. in nature, uh, you have the chiefs and uh, probably the, uh, the village chiefs and then it comes down. So there's, uh, there's the Parman chief, for example in a province you have a Parman chief and then uh, you have uh, different other chiefs from the districts which make up the province and uh, it goes down like that. So the Parman chief usually, uh, you know, if, wants, if he or she wants something done then they have a meeting. The chiefs of the clans have a meeting and then they decide what to do. And from there the orders are carried down right to the, uh, you know, the uh, villagers or the youths or the request. Probably I should say request, not order. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and that when, when the communal thing comes in. When the uh, request goes down, it's not carried out by one individual person, it's carried out by the whole, whole commun community. For instance, if a young fellow comes in, he would not sit beyond his father, because the whole seniority principle operates within the Fijian society. The most senior members of the family uh, becomes the chief or the leader of the family. And uh, apart from that, then goes down to the, the mother and then the young children. people in the village now uh, to look at the community and to develop themselves in some ways, some ways to develop their, themselves in uh, looking for job. If not looking for job, they have to stay with a family, with a community, doing the work, working of the community, being given to the chief, by the chief or what. They have to contribute and do the work of the, the village. In my village, that uh, the young young ones, uh, the youth, are like the workers for the chief. If the chief wants something to be done, so he the only easy way to organize it because the, the youth are there. So we could say that the youths are somewhere at the bottom. They, they carry out the functions which, uh, which are specified by the, uh, the village elders or the chiefs. Uh, a decision does not get made and carried out unless and until it's been, it's been sanctioned by the rest of, of the, uh, the elders, uh, the, the older community members. And so in most cases, young people do not necessarily make independent and individual decisions. Not until they reach certain age say uh, 21 but that's a little late but, uh, 21 then there's a cel celebration parents gives the 21 birthday key then he's allowed to make decisions live on his own that's it 21 years and over but that's barely existing now because most <coughs> children they travel to urban areas to find better life better facilities rather than living in the village where someone is always the boss of them every time.
reality is most traditional Fijian families in Fiji, there is hardly any openness at all. They will talk about other things. They will talk about little things. Well, to be honest, there's no real discussion between parents and children at all. In, in a re if you take the traditional Fijian family. The parents say this, the children are supposed to do this. You see, the respect for elders is no problem. I respect my elders, but I still work and do my work. I do my job. You know, in a society where I respect, you respect those people who respect you. We have a saying in Fijian that we say, the chief is the people himself. You cannot be a chief without people. And without people, you cannot be a chief. Or without chief, there will be no people. If a chief doesn't give, then uh, you know, he's not a good chief. If he puts everything in his pocket today, then no, uh, you, you can't get the followers. Then the people who say, he's not a chief, he's not chiefly like. The chief must protect, must encourage, must provide for the people. But the people must respect and obey their chiefs. It's a reciprocal relationship. It's not a one-way relation. We also have contradictory signals coming from uh, Fijian leaders who say on one hand to respect uh, Fijian uh, culture and tradition, and, but on the other hand, they also say that uh, you have to be a good businessman, you have to think only of yourself and uh, don't worry about uh, your traditional obligation or this and that. So these are the two extremes coming in. I am sure they, they, uh, they are in touch, they know what is happening. But you know, they are also threatened. It is their position which is being challenged, being undermined by the nature of the kind of youth we got nowadays, that start to ask questions about traditional order. <laughs> There's a lot of differences, political, religious, and, uh, and also uh, within the traditional leadership. And this sort of, you know, creates differences amongst the people. Uh, not only during the election, but the, uh, the repercussions of it goes, goes on until probably the next election. And uh, also in the traditional leadership, we have uh, people who are supporting certain chiefs or chiefly camps or traditional leaders and that also is a bit divisive. And uh, finally in the religious, uh, in a religious sense, in the, even though they are all Christians, there's, uh, there are also uh, you know, different uh, camps, uh, Christian camps. Other groups coming in from America, smaller uh, Christian groups, more fundamentalist, and um, I think it's becoming evident that they're wreaking a bit of havoc, you know, among the Christian consciousness of people. And uh, significantly with a lot of these new groups too, they're very right-winged in the sense that uh, it has a lot of economic overtones and uh, not seeing that the poor as poor are to be of great concern to us, you know. Some of these churches are also preaching a sort of prosperity, you know, that God loves you, therefore you will be blessed, or rather, if you are successful and uh, wealthy, it's a sign of God's blessing and uh, God's love for you. If people are poor, well, it's obviously their fault, God doesn't love them, and, uh, you know, some of this is atrocious, but we find it's there. I think we've got to be critical of the churches, uh, my own church, the Catholic Church, uh, the Methodist Church, uh, and other churches here in the country. I think we've got to be very careful that in uh, asking people to give, we're not putting them into greater poverty. Very few people do research on poverty. 
as always, it's really hard to get exact statistics, you know, and a lot of the statistics that you want are not there. They do research on, you know, economic development and uh, business development, but not too many researchers are interested on poverty. Uh, some recent uh, studies at university by Ganesh Chand pointed out that uh, in the government poverty report in, um, I think that was about three years ago, uh, two or three years ago, uh, it said that anybody who earned below uh, $3,000 a year would be considered to be in poverty. Anybody earning below $5,000 would be considered to be in danger of poverty. So according to those statistics except or those figures given by government, Ganesh Chan said, well, that means that 72% of wage earners in the country are at least in danger of poverty. People don't have uh, pipe water. People have very poor housing. And conditions so close to super, unbelievable, no light, no electricity. Uh, we're not asking for refrigerators and TVs and all the rest of it, but I guess these days, at least in an urban area, people are expecting to have uh, water, pipe water, uh, to have decent housing and to have uh, a bit of electricity available. And uh, it's surprising the number of areas where even yet those are not available. <laughs> moment, I suppose since the 80s, we've been throughout the world, the World Bank and the IMF um, and the G7 countries have been pushing economic policies of the new right. And those policies are based on the principle of economic rationalism. And uh, those policies seem to be to the advantage of the richer countries in the world. The developing countries in the world are serving the needs of the richer countries. <laughs> Mostly drunken people, they come and buy barbecue. And uh, overnight people, like uh, grog, groggy people, and uh, working overnight, I used to feed them here. Yeah. Or they don't harm me. They ask for food, I give them. I, I work all night, eh? Daytime I have a good rest. In daytime, I feel weak. The cigarette. Eh? If you want to enjoy, you could have a lot of money. Could not drop. No. Because beer is very expensive. And the tow is very expensive. Eh? If you don't have some money, then it's... Uh, I don't know what to do. been a lot of children dropped out of schools. I think a couple of years ago the education department did some research of their own and they came up with a figure of something like 50,000 uh, children of school age were not in school. A lot of people I think it's to do with the economy again, um, they have they got the finances, um, all the interest is just not there if they think a lot of young people believe that if they're um, they can't get a job, why, you know, why should I go through the tertiary system? And we suggested that one of the reasons was the uh, increase of poverty in the country, that people were no longer able to pay those costs. And while government has been targeting um, sort of free education for primary school children, um, we've been pointing out that there are a lot of hidden costs of free education, you know. My parents have been separated for more than six years, six years and um, my father's living in a village and my mom's at Kinoya. 
that's a residential place outside Suva. I'd say she's earning probably $220 a month. It's just enough to support my two brothers and sisters and herself and all the basic needs, food, water and shelter. The, my mom couldn't afford for the, my education and um, I was lucky enough to be accepted in a Chevalier hostel. So Father Ba, Father Kevin Ba, uh, got me a sponsor. While tuition seems to be free in many schools, uh, if people have still got to buy the uniforms, buy lunch for the children, buy sandals, buy books, and most schools charge some sort of a fee, um, you know, for books or for sport. I've known of a friend called, his name is James. Now he's paying for the, his younger brother's expensive school in the, back in the village. And he has to quit school because of, the, because of his younger brother back at school. Very good guy, but I'm sorry that uh, he has quit school. He's doing, a, he's been, I think he's doing a very big, bad mistake. I don't think there's, it is instilled in young Fijian youth the importance of, the critical importance of education, um, the importance of money, the importance of planning for the future. I mean, uh, priorities for me. Like for me as a teenager now, I have to, like, uh, I and mean, they have God first there. And then secondly, I have my family. In the family, I believe, and I have my, my priority for myself, what I have personally, personal needs, or whatever things. Uh, I may agree to him, but my priorities uh, I must admit that it is me first, education first, then I should always be straight with God, that's it. But the main thing is to have my education first. My first priority, top priority is education, that's it. And family comes second. If you look at the Fijian family, the guy is supposed to get the, as much education he's able to get to get a job. After that, he goes out and works and normally has to look after an extended family. So there is no time for him to be out getting more education when he's supposed to be looking for a job and looking after his mother or his sisters. And that is his role. He's supposed to just go up to sixth form, get a job after that, probably something that pays I don't know how much, and he is supposed to look after the family then. I don't have time to play. I just uh, go home and uh, cook and uh, look after the kids. And after that, study and then have dinner and go off to sleep. And the girls are supposed to just get as much as they can and um, yeah, get a job and start looking after the extended family. The thing is, the extended family is normally a lot living in, is not only the nuclear family. <laughs> That's why young kids are quitting school in rural areas. They've been pressured by adults, their parents, like they have to work because they don't think, their parents don't think of uh, the importance of education, educating a child. Some are well educated, but some are just finished. They, some they do not find, uh, they, do not, they do not want to find work. Just come around, stay around the village, just plant somewhere. Mm. They say that uh, now in Fiji, only well-educated people can 
find work easier. Sometimes we feel very, we feel bad, you know, like we just want to leave and uh, help, try and help ourselves, especially with education, and try and show them that uh, achieve what it uh, achieve uh, better things than them, what they have achieved. Like show them that education can put us right on the top. Indian cane farm will mortgage themselves and their entire farm to pay for their children's education. The cost to them, it's critical. It is the means by which they will elevate their children out of the cane farm. Whereas a communal community, on the other hand, which is self-sufficient and quite satisfied and emphasizes the interrelationship and the homogeneity, uniformity of people, um, would not emphasize the importance of one person sticking out or trying to get out of this environment. Why would he? I mean, we look after him perfectly all right. Uh, why would he try and leave us and excel himself so and the sad thing is in school when 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 a student or when a parent can't pay up his or her child fees they just chase him home and, and in some situation the child misses the exam And of course, when we are looking at small, small economies, small islands economies, uh, the market may be very limited, uh, and the kind of skills that could be uh, provided uh, would also be very limited, and very few people would be able to provide those skills. It is skill for a market economy, but not even for a market economy. It's skill of writing and knowing something new. So they are all mostly abstract, academic in a sense. Very, li very little is practical outside. Now the schools, due to the, the, the kind of curriculum or syllabus that they have, uh, do not necessarily provide those type of skills or the kind of thinking uh, that those, the, the students would need uh, to be able to, to, to do things uh, whether in school, out of school, wherever, in whatever location or environment they are in. They have been told that if you finish school, you are likely to get employment, or that's what they aspire for. Uh, but in most of the countries of the, of the region, uh, this is not the case, uh, basically because there are no jobs. It's, it's just a, a, frustrating, uh, a frustrating exercise. Skills are never perpetuated, eh? It changes. Once the market is exhausted, your skill is useless.
Fiji must not go all the way to be an industrial society. It will never become an industrial society, okay? It's so small. The resources are not there. I was chairman of the Fiji Train Investment Board, and at the height of the coup, we have nothing, no business. So we tried to get the business back here. So we have the situation, for example, whereby a government is saying, well, we need employment, and the government has been telling us that in the last few years they've provided 10 to 11,000 jobs. And we tried to get the industry started. But we look for industries that will not pollute the environment. We look for the government industries. And in order to get the government away, then we have to really be very, very alert with the whole international system. And, I mean, that sounds good until you find that most of those jobs are in low-paid pay employment in uh, the garment factories, for example, in fish factories. So most of those jobs are in tax-free zones where all the benefits are going to the developers. And a lot of the wages that women have been receiving in the garment industry have been uh, as low as $28 a week. Now, the poverty report that was given to government some years ago said that at least $60 a week uh, should be the, if you like, a basic wage. So the people in full-time employment should be earning that, otherwise they're falling into poverty. And uh, that seems to be the fact that the policies at the moment are geared to so-called economic development, uh, to helping business get going in the hope that something will trickle down to the poor. But uh, it just doesn't seem to happen. justice is being done to people, you know, and just wages are not being paid. On the other hand, people are saying, well, unless we can guarantee low wages, we won't get developers. But what sort of development is it? They're just exploiting people, basically, and if the wages do begin to rise, then they uh, move elsewhere. They're the footloose developers, as with the, uh, the book say. Uh, they just move wherever the wages are lowest. And I don't think, really, that's the type of a, a development we need to encourage. Fiji is such a nice place, full of resources, the climate is good. So what else do we want? All that you need is to have the strength, the endurance, and the skill to grow this. But it's unfortunate we are losing this. And everybody is going for money. You know very well that only big companies that are like the oil companies who are controlling the money. The banks and others are controlling the money. And if we don't have the money, if we will be entirely depend on the money, then the life, the quality of life that we have now will go. under the advice from the World Bank, um, low-cost housing in Nambua and Rewonga and these places, uh, which previously cost people uh, maybe $8 a month, suddenly went up from $8 to $54 uh, a month. And lots of people weren't able to cope with that. The response of the World Bank was that, um, according to the principle that the user pays, uh, that if you can't pay, you get out. And I think the words used by the man from the World Bank was, uh, if people can't play, pay, flush them out, you know, it didn't seem to matter where they went, but just get rid of them, you know, let them find another place. Whereas the Fijian value system of accommodating always the others first, we always try to look at the other, because it's a group mentality. It's a group mentality where you always try to think about the other members of the group, you'll be the last one. But that is changing. So, my greatest fear is the losing of our, the, the most important thing to me is human relationships. You know, a human being is the most important thing than the material things. And my fear that increasingly human being will not be so important to many.
And when I say that, it's very important because I no longer respect human beings as such. I only respect material things. If I have a lot of money, I don't really care what happens to you. I step over you. If you're not making a contribution, you're not, you are not a worthwhile member of that family. Although they, they'll tolerate you for some time. But you can't go on like that. They go to the city and wait there because they can't go back to the village. To go back to the village, the people in the village will say, ah, oh, you wasted his my father's money, his creation, and other things. Why is he coming back to the village? But how can these people go back to the land when they're not conditioned to it? And some of them don't even know how to plant cassava. Some of these people go home, uh, they don't know what they had learned. Uh, some of them, like I said, some of them have been literate and then going back to their own communities and, and become illiterate again. In, in most of the cases, uh, a lot of the young people that we work with uh, one of the major problems is really them not knowing what to do and not knowing what is their problem. They find it difficult to, to see what's wrong with me, what, what's, what's wrong here. And you see, in the villages I learn English. I start to learn English when I'm small. But are there Englishmen around the house or around the village that I could speak to? None. So I'm learning English there. Why? Because it is hoped that one day I will speak English and move out into the urban areas. So the problem with the urban areas is a problem of early alienation of the people through the kind of learning that they have, preparing themselves to go away from the village. Personally, that community is a strength. He's inside the culture that he don't know himself and he don't know where he's come from. And if they haven't reached the pay, the, the kind of job that they, 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 they are aiming for, they just lost it. hardly anybody who, who will understand them. I think that's what, uh, speaking from uh, an NPC point of view, that uh, it seems that nobody understands us. Understands us, see? Eh? Who else will understand me? My parents were supposed to understand me. And then, uh, not to be understood by the parents. <laughs> what else to do? There's nobody else who I can, I can trust. I find a lot of young Fijian men, because we're a Christian country, are brought up in Christian homes. So they have instilled in them not only a, a respect for authority, an almost unquestioning respect for authority, which stems from their traditional upbringings, perhaps, where you listened and you obeyed your elders and you said very little uh, about what you felt or thought about things. Um, the law, with all its force and majesty, had to be right. They wouldn't be there otherwise. 
And they also have a very strong sense of right and wrong in a moral sense. So quite often, young Fijian men will plead guilty in law when they really mean that I did something wrong in morals. And although law and morals are meant to mirror each other, that's not always the case. Uh, we have a problem also with interpretation, where a lot of young Fijian males who feel more comfortable in their vernacular uh, have charges read to them, technical legal charges read to them in technical legal English language, and that is supposed to be translated to them in Fijian. But quite often, the Fijian language itself has limitations in being able to convey sometimes what are complex legal propositions into simple Fijian so they can understand it. Uh, they do not know how to defend themselves. They do not know how to give mitigating factors to defend themselves. <clears throat> I mean to say, if they really do not commit offense, but they are easily influenced by uh, law enforcement agencies. They just easily gave in, thinking that they will be face leniency from the court. But uh, it was on the contrary. I have seen young men come into that court and, yeah, it's a wholly foreign environment. It's an environment in which they have next to no control over. Uh, it is the force of the law, the force of government. It is quite foreign to them. Secondly, of the financial problems that a family faced, that uh, is not able for him to engage a, a counselor, a lawyer, to represent him in court. And the only way out is to plead guilty and whatever come across from the court, you just have to face it. We see the last step of the process, you know. The courts are always at the tail end of a mounting social problem. Uh, that's one of society's responses to social problems, uh, is the criminal justice system. And we, who work in the system, realize that we are at the tail end, and that perhaps the criminal justice system isn't the solution when you begin to examine what the causes are for this problem. I am from 6 and I failed my exam. I don't know why I'm failing. I really study hard. I don't know. I will get a job. That's what I'm thinking of. After that then I fail and I heard from everyone Hey, you can't get a job from that. They just uh, talked about you, eh? bad thing about you. And uh, especially the family. Talk about your family. So I decided to go. I live with my um, uncle. We get married and he's gonna raise his uh, children. Not feel. Uh, the same as the children because, because I'm a different one. That's what I think. And I experience it through look, looking. I start thinking to myself that I should go back. Gangs, you know. They normally go around the uh, street you know, looking for money. Like that. Now we sit down together and plan. You know? Just to make us happy, that's all. 
kasi lot of uh, drugs like it. alcoholic or we rape a uh, 16 years old girl and uh, I feel uh, great you know I just uh, drinking beer and then uh, I feel embarrassed The time I in prison, I realized that uh, I done something wrong. I remember about my family, what I'm doing, what I'm already done, and what will cost my family name. I miss my friends, family. Eh? This is. A Six uh, months uh, in uh, sin. He just came twice, so I don't know. Maybe they don't want to see me, something like that. Actually, you don't have to trust anybody. You have to go by home. That's what I think. A society which allows such a large proportion of its young people to be processed by the criminal justice system and have criminal records for what they're worth uh, before they turn 28, there must be something wrong with it. Either the system doesn't work or the system is geared to system either doesn't work or it's geared to a situation which can only be bad for society as a whole. Some of our youth have been in other prisons. We were trying to stop that thing. Um, anyway, youth weren't meant to be put in prison, see? Youth were meant to be the driving energy of this society, you know? <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,